Hello. May I invite you all to start, please? May I invite uh, Dr. Mohamed Aikadi to come to the podium? May, may, may I invite Peter Blazer to come to the podium, please? Please, Peter. Yeah. Next to. Yeah. Let, let me. May I, may I invite uh, His Excellency Inia Seruratu to come to the podium, podium. And let me invite also Ankit Kawatra to come. Thank you. Welcome, everybody. I am pleased to welcome you all to the Agricultural Action Day. We are gathered here today to discuss agriculture-based climate solutions. As we all know, the impacts of climate change pose severe threats to our food systems worldwide. The agricultural sector is more exposed to the effects of climate change than any other economic sector. Agriculture bears over 80% of the economic impacts of droughts. Hardest hit are the smallholder and family farmers, pastoralists, fishing, and forest communities, who provide the bulk of our planet's food. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change estimates that climate change might further increase the risk of hunger and malnutrition by up to 20% by 2050. At the same time, agricultural land use changes contribute up to a quarter of the total anthropogenic greenhouse gas emissions. In the case of methane, agriculture is even responsible for about half of anthropogenic emissions. It is clear that without quick and effective climate solutions, our goals of reaching zero hunger, eradicating poverty, I welcome Minister Inia from B Fiji, please, Minister, next to the young guy. It is clear that without quick and effective climate solutions over goals of reaching zero hunger, eradicating poverty, and combating climate change will be increasing out of reach. We need quick and drastic actions to transform our food system into more sustainable, climate resilient, and climate smart ones. Today, we will showcase and discuss successful agricultural-based climate solutions, climate solutions that can and should be a scale-up to contribute not only to climate change mitigation, but also to help us, and especially the poorest of the earth, adapt and build resilience to climate change. Such adaptation and resilience to climate change is particularly important in a small island developing states, the seeds. Seeds are severely affected by changing rainfall patterns, drought, and a growing intensity of cyclones like we have seen in the last few months. The majority of seeds are also coping with multiple forms of malnutrition. Effective climate action in the agricultural sector is therefore particularly needed in seeds. I am glad to welcome Inia Seroiratu, Minister of Agriculture, Rural and Maritime Development and National Disaster Management of Fiji, which holds COP23 presidency, who will tell us more about the particular climate change that seeds such as Fiji are dealing with. I am also proud to welcome today Mohamed Aid Kadi, uh, from the Ministry of Agriculture and Fisheries of Morocco and President of the Agricultural Board, and Peter Blizzard, uh, 
permanent secretary to the parliament of the Federal uh, Minister of Food and Agriculture of Germany. These three ministries will help us set the scene for today. They will provide the valuable insights on the road from COP22 to 23 and into the future. I am particularly happy to have in our midst today young people active in the agricultural sector. Far too often, climate actions are taken without the engagement of the people that actually matter, the people on the ground who makes a difference in their di in indirect surroundings. In this opening, the remarkable young man and Kit Kawatra, founder of Feeding India, and young leader of the, for the Sustainable Development Goals will give a short talk about the challenges of climate change for agriculture in the next uh, generations. Throughout the day, young people active in the agricultural sector will follow the event and give us their perspective on the present agricultural-based climate solutions at the closing of this Agricultural Action Day. So without further, let me welcome you. Welcome, please, Dr. Mohamed Eid Kadi, President of the General Council of Agriculture Development, representing His Excellency Aziz Hakamardouche, Minister of Agriculture and Fisheries of Morocco, and, and invite him to give a keynote speech. Please, note that Morocco held the COP22 presidency. Note that he was speaking in the agricultural event in COP22, and he's a good friend of FAO. Please, uh, Mohamed, come. Excellencies, ladies and uh, gentlemen, I am uh, grateful for the opportunity to speak in this uh, panel, and I would like to, ta to thank FAO and its partners for the kind invitation. I would like also uh, to convey Mr. Uh, Aziz Akhanouch, Minister of uh, Agriculture, uh, Fishery, Rural Development, and Forestry. He would have loved, truly, to be here today, but uh, he couldn't uh, due to unforeseen government uh, duty. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, Morocco has built COP22 held in Marrakesh as the COP of action, translating progress achieved in uh, COP22 in Paris in concrete terms, and the COP for Africa, providing a unique opportunity to showcase actions for and in Africa, bearing in mind that vulnerability and adaptation are issues of high priority. COP22 was for agriculture a landmark, and I dare to say a historical COP as the Marrakesh Proclamation explicitly refers to agriculture. The, pro the proclamation states, I quote, we, heads of states, governments, and delegation gathered in Marrakesh on African soil, call for all parties to strengthen and support efforts to eradicate poverty, ensure food security, and to take stringent action to deal with climate challenges in agriculture." End of quote. Hence, Marrakesh proclamation has opened the door for more adaptation in the agriculture sector. The willingness to address agriculture and food security finally appears 
to be bearing some impact. By including food security and agriculture in Marrakesh proclamation, the international community fully acknowledges that urgent attention is needed to preserve the well-being and future of those who are on the front line of climate change threats and impacts. This is a game changer for the 240 million African people still suffering from chronic hunger and the 80% of the continent's poor who live in rural areas and earn their income via agriculture sector. Already vulnerable to erratic weather patterns, Africa is the continent least able to meet the costs of adaptation to climate change and needs access to the technologies and funds to exploit its massive agricultural development potential. For these reasons, we were strongly convinced that COP22 in Marrakesh was the right moment to create a delivery system to drive forward implementation of agricultural interventions in Africa. The adaptation of African agriculture initiative, AAA, originates from this conviction. It was launched by Morocco to enable African agriculture to simultaneously improve productivity, reduce vulnerability, increase resilience, and manage natural resources more sustainably. It is closely aligned to realizing the ambitions agreed in COP21 and associated finance commitment. The AAA initiative echoes the commitments made under the Comprehensive African Agricultural Program, CADEP, as articulated in the MAPU II and the Malabu Declaration, as well as the Dakar African Development Bank High-Level Conference, and the Abidjan FAO Declaration 2016, calling for the transformation of African agriculture into a globally competitive, inclusive, and business-oriented sector that creates wealth, generates gainful employment, and improves quality of life. It also seeks to bring to scale existing and successful initiatives across Africa. I would like also to emphasize that the AAA initiative will contribute to achieving sustainable development goals as its potentials are geared to most of the SDGs. We are grat gratified by the fact that the AAA is now high in the political agenda, especially since Morocco rejoined the African Union. The initiative enjoys today the support of a large number of African countries, international and regional organizations, and financing institutions, the private sector, and the NGOs. It is also supported by a high-level international scientific committee drawing on expertise from the most renowned research and academic institutions worldwide. To maintain the momentum that the AAA initiative has achieved and to deliver on the high expectation that have been set as a result of success today, we are very conscious of the paramount importance to demonstrate tangible results quickly. As we reported yesterday in the AAA side event, we are engaged with 13 partner African countries, providing support for capacity building, support for the development of country-level strategic plans 
for agriculture sector adaptation and, and transformation and support for the development of specific projects at country level in the four areas covered by the AAA. And soils management, water management, risk management, and the innovative agricultural finance. We plan to develop a technology platform to match country level projects with funders and partners. I take this opportunity to express our deepest appreciation to FAO, World Bank, African Development Bank, the French Development Agency, IFD, for their continued support to this collective endeavor. Mr. President, we share with you the motto, further, faster, together. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, dear friend, Mohammed, for the hope and the message of, of wisdom. Let me now welcome His Excellency, Peter Blazar, Parliamentary State Secretary to the Federal Minister. Peter, the floor is yours. Sehr geehrter Herr Generaldirektor, Vizegeneraldirektor der FAO, lieber Herr Castro, sehr geehrter Herr Minister Serio Atu, lieber Herr Kavatra und lieber Aid Kadidi, meine sehr verehrten Damen und Herren, ich freue mich sehr, hier in Bonn Sie zu dem Landwirtschaftstag der FAO im Rahmen der Weltkonferenz COP23 begrüßen zu können. Bonn ist nicht nur ein wichtiger Sitz der Vereinten Nationen, des Klimasekretariats und Standort des Europäischen Forstinstitutes, sondern auch der erste Sitz meines Hauses, des Bundesministeriums für Ernährung und Landwirtschaft, Sie tagen also an einem Ort, der prädestiniert ist, sich um internationale Fragen des Klimaschutzes sowie der Land- und Forstwirtschaft zu kümmern und darüber zu diskutieren. Meine Damen und Herren, Land- und Forstwirtschaft sind wesentliche Elemente, wenn es um die Ziele des Klimaübereinkommens in Paris geht, nämlich um nachhaltige Entwicklungsziele der Vereinten Nationen. SGGs und diese äh, zu erreichen. Landwirtschaft ist kein Selbstzweck, sondern die Grundlage unserer Ernährung. Und ich sage es in meinen Veranstaltungen immer sehr deutlich, ohne Landwirtschaft wäre niemand von Ihnen hier. Das müssen wir immer wieder im Blick behalten, wenn es um Beiträge unserer Bauernfamilien zum Klimaschutz geht. Sehr geehrter Herr Minister Seruatu, ich freue mich, dass die Fidschi-Präsidentschaft den Mut und die Energie hat, sich der Herausforderung der COP23-Präsidentschaft zu stellen. Herzlichen Dank dafür. Meine Damen und Herren, anlässlich des Welternährungstages am 16. Oktober hat Papst Franziskus in Rom an die Welt einen eindringlichen Appell gerichtet. Ich zitiere, es ist ganz offensichtlich, dass Kriege und klimatische Veränderungen die Ursache von Hunger sind. Also lasst uns nicht darstellen, als sei Hunger eine unheilbare Krankheit. Ende des Zitats. Diesen Appell des Papstes fühlt sich die Bundesregierung bei der Ausgestaltung der Ernährungs- und Landwirtschaftspolitik verpflichtet. Wenn ich mit den Bauern und Forstleuten in Deutschland, Europa, aber auch in der ganzen Welt spreche, dann erfahre ich, Land- und Forstwirtschaft sind bereit, ihren Anteil und ihren Teil an der Verantwortung zu tragen. Schon aus eigenem Interesse 
Kaum ein Wirtschaftszweig ist so stark vom Klimawandel betroffen wie die Landwirtschaft. Dürre, Frost, Stürme oder Starkregen zerstören Ernten, vernichten ganze Lebensräume und gefährden so Ernährungssicherheit weltweit. Gleichzeitig spielt der Agrarsektor eine zentrale Rolle bei der Umsetzung des Weltklimavertrages, denn er ist bislang der einzige Sektor, der Treibhausgase speichern kann. Deshalb sage ich ganz klar, die Klimaziele erreichen wir nur mit der Land- und Forstwirtschaft und nicht gegen sie. Und ich sage es auch noch deutlicher, die Landwirtschaft ist zwar auch Teil des Problems, aber sie ist noch größerer Teil der Lösung. Meine Damen und Herren, nach Angaben der Vereinten Nationen werden wir 2050 fast 10 Milliarden Menschen auf der Erde sein. Die Landwirtschaft ist damit der Ernährung einer wachsenden Weltbevölkerung verpflichtet. Die Bekämpfung des Hungers ist ihre vornehmste und vorrangigste Aufgabe. Das hat die Staatengemeinschaft in den Sustainable Development Goals sehr deutlich beschrieben und als Ziel 2 definiert. Auch die Präambel des Pariser Klimaübereinkommens räumt die Ernährungssicherung hohe Priorität ein. Wir dürfen nicht den Fehler begehen, Landwirtschaft und den Klimaschutz gegeneinander auszuspielen. Sie gehören zusammen. Wir müssen ehrlich miteinander sein und anerkennen, dass Lebensmittel nicht mit Nullemissionen zu erzeugen sind. Wir haben die ethische, moralische Verpflichtung, in Gunstregionen die Flächen nachhaltig für die Ernährungssicherung zu nutzen. Es geht darum, möglichst klimaschonend zu arbeiten. Und es geht auch darum, gemeinsam zu handeln, um Klimaschutz und Ernährungssicherung in einem fairen Ausgleich zusammenzubringen. Und ich glaube, das geht nur mit modernster Technologie, die umweltschonend eingesetzt wird. Meine Damen und Herren, essentiell für gemeinsames Handeln sind neueste wissenschaftliche Erkenntnisse, die allen Akteuren zur Verfügung stehen. Deshalb freue ich mich, dass unser Ministerium über den bilateralen Treuhandfonds ein Projekt anstoßen wird, in dem die FAO eine Wissensplattform im Bereich Landwirtschaft und Klima entwickelt. Diese soll es den Partnerländern ermöglichen, sich über Maßnahmen im Bereich der Landwirtschaft zur Anpassung an den Klimawandel und zur Minderung des Klimawandels auszutauschen. Mit 500.000 Euro werden wir die Arbeit unterstützen. Das unterstreicht die Rolle Deutschlands als verlässlicher Partner der FAO. Meine Damen und Herren, auch unsere Bäuerinnen und Bauern sind Betroffene von Klimakatastrophen. Wir müssen daher jetzt miteinander die Weichen stellen, um in Zukunft unbeherrschbare Folgen des Klimawandels zu verhindern. Miteinander, das heißt mit Landwirten, Wissenschaftlern, Politik und Zivilgesellschaft, müssen wir an tragfähigen Lösungen arbeiten, wie Klimaschutz und Landwirtschaft in Einklang zu bringen sind. Dieses Miteinander wünsche ich mir in der COP23-Beratung Ihren Events mögen hierzu ein guter Beitrag sein. Ihre Events mögen hierzu ein guter Beitrag sein. Und ich hoffe, dass die Veranstaltung hier in Bonn, in Deutschland, ein weiterer Wegstein, Meilenstein dafür ist, dass wir einem besseren Klimaschutz dienen können. Herzlichen Dank. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Peter Blazer, to remind us that hunger is a crime to basic human rights. Thank you to remind us that agriculture is part of the solution to the climate change challenge. Let me now introduce His Excellency, Inia Seruiratu, Minister for Agriculture, Rural and Maritime Development, and National Disaster Management of Fiji. Please, I invite you to give a keynote speech. Remember that Fiji is the COP23 presidency. Please, Minister, you have the floor. Uh, 
Excellencies, distinguished guests, uh, ladies and gentlemen, um, Bulubinaka, Guten Morgen, and a very good morning to you all. As the high-level champion for global climate action, and on behalf of the Fiji COP23, COP Fiji COP Presidency, I warmly welcome you to the Agriculture Action Day. I'm very happy to be here this morning at the opening of the Global Climate Action Agriculture Day. We are gathered at an important moment in the international response to climate change. We have just been informed that 2017 was one of the hottest years on record. We are seeing more severe and frequent natural disasters and extreme weather events. From the devastating hurricanes in the Caribbean to the droughts in sub-Saharan Africa and the flooding in South Asia, we are already feeling the impacts of climate change across the globe, and this is just the beginning. As the Minister for Agriculture in a small, vulnerable island state, I am acutely aware of the challenges brought about by climate change to our agriculture sector. Climate change is already affecting our agriculture systems, our food production, our local diet, our local livelihoods, our national economy, and our way of life. Sea level rise is driving coastal erosion and washing away of arable land and backyard home gardens. Our coastal communities are forced to plant their daily food supply a distance from their home, placing extra burden to our women. We are experiencing more intense floods, causing large-scale loss to our local economy and depriving our local farmers and rural communities of their main source of income. Seasonal and climatic uh, variability are causing changes in the timing of life cycles, in migration patterns, in breeding, and in flowering. This is creating havoc among our farmers who rely on traditional cropping calendars to guide their planting and harvesting seasons. These traditional calendars are no longer relevant. We are working with our farming communities to respond. We are supporting them to identify the climate risks they face and adopt new varieties of crops that are more resilient to drought, salinity, flooding, and extreme temperatures. And I am confident that our farming communities can adapt if given the right tools and skills and resources. However, what we really need to do is to achieve the goals of the Paris Agreement and contain climate global temperatures, uh, temperature rise in order to prevent further uh, damaging impacts. But this is not the course we are currently on. This points to an inescapable conclusion that the world simply must do more to address climate change. But we have cause for optimism. And in my time as high-level champion, I have seen promising trends everywhere I look. One of these trends brings us here today. There is growing recognition that agriculture and land use can and must be a central part of the solution to climate change. Your presence in this room is a testament to this fact. We will only achieve the aims of the Paris Agreement and the 2030 Agenda if we scale up climate action in agriculture and land use. Ladies and gentlemen, the Marrakesh Partnership was launched in recognition that national governments alone cannot achieve the Paris goals. Success will depend on concerted action from all levels of government, the private sector, and civil society. This is certainly true 
of climate action in agriculture. The key to transforming the way we manage land, grow food, and feed our world lies with the world's farmers, rural communities, and the private sector. This has been a key focus during my time as high-level champion and in support of the Marrakesh Partnership. The prominence of agriculture, ladies and gentlemen, and land use under the Marrakesh Partnership is mirrored by a strong focus on these sectors at COP23. Numerous side events are highlighting the transformational potential of these sectors. The high-level roundtables on climate action and SDG2 will shine a light on the need for climate action to achieve a world with zero hunger. And the interesting events planned here today will allow us to share lessons and insights on a range of important issues. We will learn more about the potential to mitigate climate change through livestock and soils. We will hear about concrete experiences from the field on how data and technologies can be used to support farmers with climate change adaptation. We will learn about the challenges of water scarcity in agriculture and the urgent need to reduce food and, and loss and waste throughout our food systems. I look forward to these discussions and hope to draw on these insights for the benefit of our agriculture sector in Fiji and the Pacific and to also guide my work as champion to emphasize the urgency to scale up climate action in this very important sector. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to close with a reminder of why we are gathered here. This is not about the climate, more so than any other sector. When we talk about agriculture, we are talking about people, about farming communities trying to earn a living and families trying to feed their children. Let us not lose, not, let us not lose sight of this. Let us unite for climate action, further, faster, together. We now have a Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Minister Inia, to raise the voice for the small island development states and the world, especially coming from countries that are the ones suffering first the consequences of climate change. We are seeing some of the seeds complaining that they are disappearing as nations. And still, you raise the voice for the hunger of the world, for the farmers of the world, and on, not only for the, the small island development states. Thank you very much uh, for this uh, moral example. Let me welcome now Ankit Kawatra, who is a United Nations Young Leader for the Sustainable Development Goals and the founder of Feeding India, a network of over 2,000 volunteers in 28 cities in India, rescuing and redistributing excess food to help feed people in need. Ankit, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, thank you for this great opportunity. Um, excellencies, dignitaries, ladies and gentlemen, and boys and girls, um, a very good morning to all of you, and thank you for coming. What I find most interesting when I look at agriculture is how far we've come as a planet how we've actually created a food system and an agricultural system where we're now able to put food for at least most people on the planet. Today, a crop which is grown and harvested in an Asian land in the morning is sold in an American supermarket in the evening. And that's the level of progress we've made. But even as we've built this platform for the most fundamental commodity in the world, food, there are a lot of systematic gaps, a lot of broken linkages which exist in the supply chain system, which account for the food loss and wastage and which ultimately results in problems creating climate change problems. Increasing overdependence on a natural ecosystem. Agriculture, as we already know, has proven to have negative consequences on the climate conditions of our world. 
a major factor of these greenhouse gas emissions are now coming from agriculture-based activities, including livestock activities. And additionally, 8% of these greenhouse gas emissions coming from food loss and wasted alone. And what I find ironic completely is how agriculture at one end is creating the problem, and at the separate and another end is actually suffering from the consequences of the problem it's creating on its own. And climate change is having a devastating effect on farming and agricultural-based activities in terms of, and resulting in terms of unprecedented and, and completely difficult to forecast rainfall and floods, which, which are really tough for agricultural farmers to predict. It's increasingly tough to make decisions related to what to harvest and where to harvest, when to harvest. And this has resulted in a series of gaps in people who are not able to earn a living anymore out of agricultural-based systems that we've created on our own. But while we have these gaps, the silver lining is that, and the two things I really want to talk about is that people want to bring change. And I feel that there is hope and the fact that there are people together on ground who want to bring a change together. And I draw this from my own personal experience. When I was 22, a couple of years back, I saw food for 10,000 people being wasted in a wedding in India. And I couldn't help but think about what would happen if that food was used to solve hunger and divert that from landfills. And what started as a movement called Feeding India is now, three years later, in 55 cities, an army of 8,000 people who are responsible citizens were spreading awareness and at the same time diverting food worth $7.5 million from going to landfills. I feel that people want to make change. They want to be empowered, and they want to know how they can bring that change, especially young people. We have more, than young, we have more young people than ever before on this planet, and these people are the bearers of the consequences of the solutions that we propose today. I feel that in the coming time, and as we propose solutions, we must account for civil society. We must account for young people and how they will be affected by these changes that we enact on today. And lastly, I must talk about, and my speech would be completely incomplete, without talking about the most unappreciated, uninformed, unaware, unrepresented category of people and community in our world, which are the farmers, which right now are not getting what they truly deserve. Farming today and agriculture today represents poverty. It represents hardship. And if you think about it, it's a bed of what creates food for us for the next meal we have. Farming is represented by poverty, and that's ironic. And what we must do is we must create a system not to make agriculture sexy, really, but maybe ensuring that these farmers who are creating the food at least have a basic source of living to feed their families. They're looking, they're looking for smart practices. They're looking for smart farming techniques to look at what to harvest, when to harvest, looking at how to increase crop production within their old yields. And we must absolutely take farmers as not bearers of these burden of change that we propose today, but as solutions of change, as agents of change, who have the power to put actions into the words that we're proposing today. And so today, as I stand before you, I, I, I bear with you this call, this call from these millions of farmers who are hidden, whose voices are not heard in this room today, and who are waiting to, for help, who are waiting for us to take action and finally get help to them, and not in the form of government regulations which are riddled with the corruption roots which are, which are pre prevailing today. They're waiting that while they're providing food on our tables, they're able to provide food on theirs. And we must take into account their contribution on this effort. I, I believe that the COP23 is a reinstatement of how we're getting together to answer that call. And as I, see, as I look around, I feel there's no dearth of diversity of perspective there's no dearth of talent and intellect in this room. There's absolutely no dearth of experience. What we must do in the coming days and meetings and conferences is get together to talk about on-ground solutions, which not just take into account state and non-state actors, but civil society, young people, and most importantly, the farmers who bear the food that we create. Thank you so much. Thank you. Immediately after this, in this very same room, we're going to start talking about solutions. And we will be talking about low carbon livestock immediately. Is that possible, low carbon livestock? Can we produce? our food better with lower 
carbon intensity with the profit for the farmers. Then we will discuss integrated landscape management. And then an, uh, in parallel, managing water scarcity for agriculture. Then soil organic carbon. What is, what is that issue of the carbon on the soil? Why, why are we worried for the permafrost uh, carbon? And then why climate data is, is important for agriculture? Why FAO is engaged now in providing agro meteo information to the 77 countries of the world that has no agro meteo information today? And then climate smart agriculture, even a source book will be presented today. And globally agricultural, globally important agricultural heritage systems. How people in 18 countries has combined their traditional knowledge of producing food, culture, social networks, and making a living. And then we will talk about mountains and vulnerability of the mountains of, to climate change. And finally, we will try today to answer the question, are we going to be able to feed 10 billion people a few years from now? And to do it by increasing 50% of the production, reducing food waste, loss after harvest, reducing inefficiencies, because we need to reduce carbon emissions per capita from the average of about five tons per capita of today, eight in Europe, for example, 17 in the US, from those level to one ton per capita, which is what the atmosphere can sustain. 10 billion people, one ton per capita. We think it is doable. Please share with us in this very same room immediately, because there is no time to waste. This is Germany. Immediately, how we're going to do it in the livestock, which is supposed to be one of the most challenging sectors. Thank you, everyone. Mohammed, Peter, Inia, and Ankit. Thank you very much.